Well, thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers um, uh, for inviting me to speak tonight and be part of this event. What fun! Um, in my previous life in research and as director of the Center for Urban Ag, I did develop management plans for insects that affect turf and ornamentals, anything out there in the landscape. Um, now, as department head, I'm, I'm lucky to get out of my office. <laughs> but when I do, I uh, am still involved in the research, and I mainly work on pollinator conservation. So hence the slide of the uh, leafcutter bees here. So what a great connection uh, to talk about cannibalism <laughs> and all the gory things that uh, insects do. So maybe it's a little stretch to connect to, to the movie theme, but, but not so much. So uh, my uh, focus is, is really on how insects escape their gory fate. So anybody that has reared insects or, or really uh, observed them knows that if I put six little caterpillars in, in a small vial and come back in a week, I'm going to have one really big one. <laughs> and if uh, mama moth or butterfly uh, lays her eggs in the wrong spot on, um, on a plant that's not really the best uh, host, then those little caterpillars would much rather eat each other than eat that um, plant that's not suitable, which gives a whole new meaning to the very hungry caterpillar. <laughs> I've worked with insects for 40 years, and I think they're the most amazing, beautiful insects. And I think um, people would not argue with me with the, with the charismatic insects, like the blue morpho, or, or even the bees, because there's been uh, so much in the news about uh, the need for conservation and protection of our pollinators. But if I ask a general audience, how many of you are with me? Do you just love insects? Oh, I love it. Yes, we have, we have a lot of fans here. But in my typical... Um, audience, uh, maybe not so much. In fact, insects have been the theme for so many um, horror movies. In fact, we, we just love to hate insects, and a lot of people actually fear them. So much of what I do involves helping people get over those negativistic attitudes towards insects, because they're hugely important. But in the movies, just think about Edgar the Bug in Men in Black. And perhaps the very best example, how many of you remember the Alien series or have seen the Alien series? Well, um, the best monsters are really um, fashioned after insects. And so Xenomorph from the Alien series was uh, based on insect parasitism because it is, truly is a bug-eat-bug bug world out there. And insects have so many natural enemies, we actually um, can use them to our benefit, called ecosystem services. They provide pest control for us. So I uh, do get phone calls about what are the eggs on this hornworm's back. And in fact, they're not eggs. They're the cocoons. So what's happened is a tiny little wasp has laid her eggs inside that caterpillar. And then all of the larvae feed on the inside of the caterpillar until there's nothing left. And then they bore through the skin of the caterpillar and spin their cocoons. So when people ask me, should I leave these in the garden? Well, the answer is uh, yes, definitely. Because that's a great source of new parasitic wasps that are going to then, in turn, take care of more hornworms. But what a gruesome end for our, for our caterpillar. And in fact, there's a fairly new parasitic wasp that has the distinction of being named after Xenomorph in the Alien series. Uh, and that's truly only a, a face only a mother could love, I think. <laughs> 
But in fact, there's a tremendous number of insect parasitoids. They're mainly flies or wasps. Um, they're very rarely seen. Usually you just see the evidence of insect parasitism. Um, how many of you are gardeners? Yeah. So I'm uh, walking outside today and I see cool season aphids on all sorts of things, including my iris. And aphids um, are fed on by a number of things, but they're parasitized by a little parasitic wasp you can see up there in the right-hand corner um, with a very lyrical na name, Lysophlebus testicebus. <laughs> and so when you see um, these little aphid mummies, they look like little leathery footballs. Um, and that one has a very perfect round hole where a parasitic wasp has emerged. So that's biocontrol in action. Um, so they're working to our benefit. And truly, it is a hidden world. Azaleas are so beautiful right now, but they have a pest, azalea lace bug. Um, and you may never see this tiny little parasitic wasp that's not even as big as a leaf hair on the leaf of an azalea, but they're laying their eggs in the eggs of azalea lace bug. And oh, what an amazing world, because it's such a vicious world for an insect. They have developed all these defensive responses. So that caterpillar sitting on a leaf, it, if it de detects disturbance, it will fall on a silken thread. Maybe you've seen that. And this tiny little parasitic wasp will dive head first and repel on three of its six legs down that silken thread going faster and faster as the caterpillar lets out more and more silk uh, until it gets close enough that it can swing around, insert its ovipositor, and in that split second, it will determine, is it the right caterpillar species? Is it the right size of the right caterpillar species? Is it, has it already been parasitized? Because if it has, then she will be at a competitive disadvantage and her eggs would probably be eaten. And as fascinating as just this one little story is, there are hundreds of them. They have in the insect world counterparts to parasitism and those are predators. Um, you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with lady beetles as adults, but do are you familiar with the larvae? The thing that looks like a little alligator there on the right-hand side? That's an immature lady beetle. Um, paper wasps. How many of you think those are beneficial? <laughs> Depends on where they are, right? If they're uh, right over your doorway, maybe not so much. But um, that paper wasp is making... Um, a hamburger, really, out of a fall army worm. So they actually are good predators of pests. And if only they would only eat what we want them to, but that's not what happens. Biocontrol gone wrong. We have an assassin bug feeding on a lady beetle. And there are some fascinating stories uh, in the predator world as well. Tiger beetles I pick on here because... They are the fastest runners in the insect world. Um, I thought that would be a, a good fit. <laughs> and they, they have a behavior as immatures. They build pits in the ground. They have hooks on the back of their abdomen. They anchor themselves into the pit. Um, this particular species on beaches, um, that's a harsh environment. And the larva has an escape strategy. It leaps out of that pit, um, connects head to tail, and then rolls up to seven miles per hour down the beach. So, so our colleagues at Georgia Southern have, have identified this behavior, and they tell me that 
That's just how they roll. <laughs> so we can't do cannibalism and insects without talking about how dangerous it is sometimes um, when partners get together, <laughs> praying mantids, or, or how about black widows? <laughs> And in with the spiders and insect insects as well, um, there is a strategy where you present your partner with a nuptial gift, so they get a protein boost, and they're distracted, so that you can get away before you get eaten. This is how most people feel about spiders. <laughs> But in fact, they are very helpful. They're predators. So I'm going to point to um, the wolf spiders. Uh, they're also good parents. Here's Mama Spider with all the babies on her back. And she'll kill a caterpillar or a grasshopper. Spiderlings will run down her legs, uh, feed on that caterpillar, run back up. And, you know, insects carry and spiders carry the skeleton on the outside. In order to grow, they have to molt. So they'll molt a few times, but at some point they get big enough to be considered food. And so at that point, they make that graceful exit from the mom. I've talked about all the beneficials. Often we're talking about insects as pests, and some are just more problematic than others. And uh, one of those is fire ants. Anybody struggled with fire ants on their property? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, um, if you have ever been stung or bitten, you will be pleased to know that there is fire ant revenge. There's a parasite for fire ants. And so that fly will attack the fire ant on its leg, and sometime later... The head falls off. Isn't that great? <laughs> They're called decapitating flies. So they have been released in many locations around Georgia, and hopefully someday they'll catch up with the fire ants. Um, just in time for this series uh, was an article that came out that cannibalism helps fire ants invade new territory. Uh, maybe not such good news for us. But it turns out that fire ants will actually eat members of their own colony that are less productive. So uh, cannibalism everywhere in the insect world. This is where I have a shameless plug inviting you to come join us at the tarantula run on Saturday out at the botanical garden. This is something the students organize and, and uh, the proceeds from the tarantula run support the student outreach um, to the school system where we take all the creepy crawlies out and introduce students to the wonderful world of insects. And I hope you enjoy this film as much as I'm going to. Thank you. So we had a much full audience. It's kind of later here in Athens and I'd say we were probably, I would say close to reasonably full. Yeah. So we had a really good crowd and there was so much laughing and, you know, just <laughs> upright, like bursts of, you know, enjoyment. So thank you so much. And I wanted to introduce Suzanne, who I think you've, um, you know, spoken to quite a bit and is actually going to be moderating for us. So um, Suzanne's going to come up and I'll uh, go and take questions from the audience. But, you know, again, what an amazing feat. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, it was all the runners. We, you know, <laughs> we take little credit for that. So, um, why don't you tell us a little about about what it was like to um, to make that film? Yeah. So um, we oftentimes compare the making of that film to our own personal Barkley, yeah. um, because as many um, things that could go wrong with. Um, while you know running the Barkley itself, um, that many things happened to us while making the film, um, and you know it wouldn't be the Barkley if it was easy. So um, I think had we known going into it, we'd, it all happened very fast that we started making the film. Um, 
So, you know, we kind of just jumped in and I think, you know, in retrospect, you think of everything that you, you go through <laughs> and it took us about, um, three plus years to, to get it out there. So, um, yeah, it was, it was really tough. I'm not gonna lie. It was a, it was a difficult journey, but, um, you know, we wanted to be as respectful to the race as possible. We wanted Laz to be happy, the runners to be happy with, um, the film. And that was really like our goal in the end was to, to kind of show the, the heart and soul of the race. Um, and capture that and then so that people who would never have the chance to run it could sort of, you know, experience it vicariously. Yeah. Excellent. And I think you achieved all of that. I mean, oh. what's, what's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what stuck out to me was that it really was about the race and not about the runners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was our, that was our goal was, um, we like, we are not runners, Tim or I, Tim is the co-director, co-producer, um, who is not here right now. Um, but he and I made the film and we we're not really like sports people per se. And that's not really what, um, brought us to the film. And, um, so we definitely wanted to make a film about the Barkley. And of course, you know, Laz is a huge part of that, but we really structured the film as, um, the race itself and kind of going along in that structure versus like, you know, meeting runners and, and that sort of thing. So we really wanted to, to keep that, you know, the Barkley as like the main character. Yeah. Cool. Right. So first question. <laughs> I have a quick question. So, um, uh, so you were on this. You were working on Mad Men when you kind of got the inspiration. Is that correct yes. to make the film? Yeah. And <laughs> how much time was there to actually pull together everything? I mean, when was the race going to actually happen when you first discovered Laz and and, and yeah. the race? So, um, Tim had found this essay in the Believer magazine um, about the race that was, it's written by Leslie Jameson. um, That is, it's online and it's in um, a book that she published. It's a really amazing essay. And that's how we found about out about the Barkley. And he had read the first half of the essay and it was my roommates at the time, his uh, magazine. And um, we had to go somewhere. Tim put it down and then he couldn't get it out of his head and he couldn't get the magazine back. Like someone must have taken it. So he finally ordered it. And that was when we were in sort of, I guess, maybe three quarters of the way through a season um, of Mad Men. And he, so he ordered the magazine, finally finished it, passed it off to me and was like, you have to read this. Like, this just seems crazy. Like this can't be real. And so, um, right when we finished that season was when we started to sort of investigate, um, a little bit more, try to, you know, get in touch with labs. Um, but it was once we started, well, you know, made a decision like, Hey, maybe we should do something about this. Um, it was like within four weeks, I think we were in Tennessee to scout with labs. Like it all happened very quickly. And I, and, it's not really in my nature to do things that way. Like I much would rather plan for a year, um, but we never would have gotten what we did had we waited. So we kind of just went with it and it was during a hiatus time. So we kind of had to do it. You know, it was like, do it now or wait another year. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, me. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Laura. I. So, um, you have a mic. So, three, there were three winners that particular year. Was that just a fluke? I mean, many years I have no winners. So, you just got really lucky that year. Is that true? Have you ever had three winners before? They never have. And I should say they call them finishers, they don't call them winners because there's no real placement at the Barkley. Like, no one actually wins, they just finish and then they don't have to run again. You know, it's Laz's like um, dark humor. Um, no, that was the only year that they had three finishers. Um, we went into it thinking that no one was going to finish because that's, you know, that's more common than anything else, I think. Um, when we had started the race, it had been going on for 10, 25 years and only 10 people had ever finished it. I think that's in the movie. Um, but 
yeah, we, it was a challenge to us because this idea of going into a race like this and having no one finish, like, could you make a compelling story from that? Um, and so that was sort of a challenge we were thinking, you know, if no one finishes, you know, maybe this is a short film, maybe it's a half hour. Um, we really didn't know what was going to happen. So the three finishers and then, you know, the fact that it was like Brett breaks the record, you know, Jared's first time there. And then John Feggy's finish. It was just like, you couldn't have, you couldn't have written it. This is what's so amazing about documentaries is like, you couldn't really, I mean, you couldn't imagine something like that happening. So we were, we were really lucky the year we were there. And, and, you know, since then, the, the guy who's the physicist who broke the record, he's finished a several more times. I mean, he actually uh, has his own Facebook page and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Jared has finished a couple times. He was actually back there, um, again, this year, um, did not finish, but, um, oh, he's wow. finished three times now. Um, yeah, so you know they're they love it. Um, Brett, I know has gone back, but had um, I, I think it's had he had some sort of um, physical, you know, like back issues or something. So I know he's gone back. I think to crew maybe that happens a lot. Yeah. Um, that finishers go back to help other people. So and just to be there, share their stories. <sighs> Hi, yes, I love the film. I think we all did. Oh, thank you. Um, but I just was wondering, as you were talking about um, how uh, there were three finishers while you were mm -hmm. filming it, and I wondered if you felt like maybe filming it was a motivator to get people to keep going and to, to yeah. do something, push a little harder. Yeah, we get that question sometimes, and I think it's really interesting because... Um, I, I, I don't think it's, um, you know, I think a camera being there, you can't, you know, forget the fact that that might be a motivator a little bit for people. Um, with that said, um, I think what happened would have happened either way because these three individuals, Brett for one, they all had different goals. And so, you know, Brett wanted to break the record. Jared just wanted to finish. Um, and John Feige just had this other thing inside of him that he really needed to do. Um, and, you know, he ran that race mostly by himself. Um, so as much as, um, you know, I think it might have had some influence maybe on certain people, I really do think that... Um, what happened would have happened whether we were there or not. Um, and, you know, people have filmed, um, people were there shooting a bit before we were there. People have been there after we were there and nothing like that has happened. So I really do think it's, you know, once those people get like the fourth loop or something, they have no idea that you're standing there. I mean, they're just so like focused on what they're trying to achieve. So, um, and that's kind of my favorite part of, of the film is this idea of success and failure and how it's so important that we make our own um, definitions of that. I think uh, far too often um, failure is not is taught as a bad thing instead of it being um, something that we should all learn how to, you know, how to do, how to do, how to get through um, I, I think about myself, like if I had been taught early on to like fail often, you know, how, how great that, that freedom is, because if you're trying something and failing on it, failing on it, you're, you're testing your boundaries. Like you're really trying something. Um, and I think that, um, far too often we're, we're more concerned with success than we are with failure. Yeah. Great point. Questions? Questions? I, I thought that, you know, it's interesting that you're going into failure because halfway through the movie, I thought this movie is about failure. I mean, yeah. I mean, nobody there expects to not fail, you know, and all the things that Lazarus said, like he, he was like the possibility of success is so low. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, yeah. I mean, it's, that's something that, um, 
I, I have definitely taken into my life since the making of this film. Um, and I think about it more in, um, if, if I'm doing something, if I'm not doing something that scares me every now and then, I'm, I'm not doing enough. Um, and I have to remind myself of that sometimes. I was going to go do something the other night, and I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. And, of course, the Barclay was just happening this past weekend, so then I start thinking about Laz, and it's like, you know, what would he say? Like, what would he think about this? And it's like, well... He was looking at you expectantly with the, um, well, get your act together kind of look. <laughs> and, yeah. and he would guilt you into get doing. I have a quick yes, question. exactly. So I have a quick question. Um, just in terms of the entire um, race or the run or the you know, yeah. challenge, were you um, able to actually scout the terrain and know where to put the cameras? I think you had seven crew in total if i yeah correctly so how did you map out the race i know there's certain stations but do you have the inside track now <laughs> <On the marathon? laughs> um, well so that first um we went to tennessee about a month before the race was going to begin and we scouted um a few spots with laz so we went basically um on a day, a day and a half, maybe two days of, of hiking with him to various spots that he uh, agreed that we could um, either put a cameraman, camera person, I should say, or um, a, re a remote triggered camera. So all of these spots um, were basically, we wouldn't be getting any sort of uh, direction away to the runners. So if we were there, they pretty much already knew where they were. So, and no, we did not scout the whole course. Um, 26 miles, uh, yeah, that's not in me yet. Um, so yeah, there were just certain parts that were more accessible to us. And, you know, we, and then, you see in the film, um, one of the runners was going to wear a GoPro anyway. And so he offered us that footage. Um, we really didn't want to make a film that was, um, watching runners running along for long periods of time. Like that was not interesting to us. Um, and it's not really what we wanted to, um, have the audience take away. Um, sometimes I think they're Every now and then I'll read reviews, even though, you know, you're, I shouldn't, but, um, they're mostly positive, but every once in a while people are like, you know, I wish there was more footage of people running out there and following people along. And I'm just like, I mean, for some people that's very interesting for us. It was more about the story and about what the Barkley is for people. So, so yeah, we had a, a few spots that, <laughs> If I tried to find again, I might be able to. <laughs> well, you made an incredibly, um, you know, full-bodied narrative. So, you know, it was a really complete film. And, um, you. you know, really enjoyed the way you, um, you know, the way you sort of went about the concept of how to film it. So, I mean, I really appreciated it a lot. So thank you so thank much you. for taking that route with it. So. Yeah. It, was a, it was a, I mean, you can see it was an incredible challenge. I mean, what a challenge. You didn't have to go through the route to know it was unbelievable. Yeah. So you captured yeah. that fantastically. Yeah, I, and I think it comes across, I mean, when you, you know, obviously with um, the runners' bodies and how sort of torn up they are and, and just knowing that they've, you know, each time they come in from a loop, they run, you know, basically a marathon, but with a lot, a lot of elevation, um, and yeah, yeah it wasn't, wasn't we, we had, had you know, know a, a, a lot, lot of this film, film was was based, was like the structure and the editing of it and it took us so so long to um cut it to a point where we felt like we had everything we wanted in there um because there's so many elements of the race that we had to tell the tell the audience without sort of overwhelming them. So it was really sort of like this piecemeal um, structure that we came up with and so that you don't, you know, get every piece of information within the first five minutes that you sort of, by the end of it, you realize how 
hard it is. And by that point, you know, people are finishing and <laughs> doing their their crazy um, crazy stuff. So yeah, was, I should I give a lot of credit to um, we had an editor Mariana Blanco who helped us to get it to a good two hour cut, and then we sort of took it back again and really had to get rid of a lot of footage that we loved. You know, there were other storylines that we had to cut just because we wanted to make it um, 90 minutes. That was our goal was 90 minutes and, and make it make the momentum enough that you feel like you're still there. So like keep that momentum going. And yeah, it was, it was it's tough. 90, it's 90 minutes of a journey. I mean, it, you yeah. in that film, take everybody on that journey, even though you don't see a thing of what happens out there in the field and stuff. Yeah. You really do feel that you're on that journey with them. Uh, yeah, that was that was really our goal, and and um, you know we decided there's only one really quick interview that's that's done indoors. Um, I mean, Laz with his map is indoors, but everyone's sort of like sit down interviews are all outside. Like we really wanted it to feel like you were there. Um, so yeah, we kind of kept that. Um, yeah, kept that for all the all the decisions we made. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, thank you very much, Annika. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for watching and supporting the film. It's really through like independent theaters like your own and people talking about the film that um, other people know about it. So we really appreciate the support. And um, yeah, it's been a, a great, crazy journey, yeah. <laughs> just like the Barclay itself. So thank you so much. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you.